welcome back to the channel everyone be sure to subscribe be sure to like the video if you enjoy the content daily indoor football league content here on the ifl network our guest today on the channel duke city gladiators kicker it's going to take some getting used to saying that title ernesto lacayo ernesto thanks so much for joining us today man it's a pleasure and it's always an honor to talk indoor football awesome man well look if there's a guy to talk about it and there's a guy to talk about the indoor kicking game you're the guy this is i mean it's year 12 what team is it for you oh man when it comes to numbers let's see i want to say team nine okay ish yeah so, <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's just kind of go through the journey of um you know finding out about the indoor game was it on your radar um what was the your first, I guess, introduction to it and how did it come about? Yeah. So, uh, when I came out of college in 2011, I went on draft in the NFL draft. And at the time, you know, I really didn't have much of an option to uh, think of anything less than the NFL until uh, my agent at that time had referred me to the arena leagues. And I had heard about the arena football league with the whole Kurt Warner stuff. And plus growing up watching the Saber cats when I was in high school, mm -hmm. Uh, but at the time in Hastings, Nebraska, there was a brand new indoor football team coming around. That was uh, the Grand Island Danger. Mm -hmm. That was only about 15 minutes from where I was at, and I went to the tryout. And I know they were looking for a local hometown talent to bring in for fans. And me and my good friend Maurice Mansfield at the time was a returner and receiver. Yeah. He got picked up. So uh, we were local fan favorites. I mean, but let me tell you, it was one of those uh, eye-opening experiences because, you know, we're tough in the outdoor game kick as far as you can on kickoff mm -hmm. and was being so big because then when I came indoors I was like oh my god these are these opals are so small the football is not even leather it's composite and yeah you know, having to be told you have to place the ball and for kickoffs not kill the ball you know it's quite an adjustment and it took some time to get used to but it was that was my first introduction and I had played about 13 games Mike Davis was uh, our head coach uh, Dixie, what was my quarterback slash holder? Curtis wow. Chandler, receiver. That... So, uh, yeah, it's funny that three head coaches uh, were former teammates of mine my rookie year. Man, you think Dixie could still get it done if he if he was thrown in there? He was an exceptional quarterback. Uh, I caught him at the tail end of his career. Yeah. But I had heard such, uh, you know, exceptional things that he was doing and watching, you know, some film. But, you know, a younger version of Dixie was dangerous. Uh, Absolutely. But, but I would have to agree that Sioux Falls quarterback, uh, Chris uh, Dixon. Oh, was, yeah, man. I mean, I played against him. I mean, he was a quarterback for Sioux Falls, and he was probably the, one of the best uh, indoor quarterbacks I'd ever seen. Just yeah. a command. I want to get into that a, a little bit more because you've kind of seen everything, but I, I want to, I want to talk about your story first before we get to that. And then I'll kind of pick your brain. But the first time that I saw you was in Portland in the AFL. Um, oh yeah. And so that is, a, it's, you know, there are the obvious comparisons, the 50 yard field, the indoor factor, but I assume that kicking in that game is so much different than indoor game because you have the luxury or had the luxury of the rebound net um right. an out of bounds kick is illegal as opposed to the IFL um and that was your that was your introduction to the AFL if I'm correct too um it was actually Vegas the year before that Ve was that's there. right with the outlaws right yes right. yes so that's what was that like that adjustment period for you well since starting in the IFL you know I knew what the intricacies had of that game and the rules and then jumping to the AFL obviously having the rebound net on the kickoff, which was great because now you can let go of your legs. So it was an easier transition uh, from the indoor game to the outdoor game when like kicking off, you don't have to like lose yardage. Uh, the ball was leather. It was nice to have more control on the ball with the leather ball in the AFL. Um, but, you know, what was fun about that game was trying to figure out on the nets, on the rebound nets, what was loose. Every arena right. had feel it so you have to go play around okay this air this area of the net is loose so i'm going to try to hit this area or this part's really really tight so you want to bounce it off there so there was a lot of little things here and there i preferred more the indoor game just because of the skill set um mm -hmm. if 
taught me how to place things. Uh, it taught me to get better on my onside kicks and then also slow down my swing thought as well. At the same time, my leg swing because the ball is different. So a composite ball, there is no sweet spot. You have to really, uh, if all goes well, having a good operation and trying to get the ball exactly where you want to be and get a good sweet spot, or not, not a sweet spot, a good feel of the ball. Whereas the yeah. AFL ball is forgiving. Um, so those are the biggest things in that sense. And in the indoor football league, you know, if you're allowed to do it, the drop kick is much more important and more forgiving than the AFL, because if you miss it, it's still a live ball, either, mm -hmm. you know, having to attempt more field goals in the indoor league, because if you miss it, okay, the ball is out of bounds. It the plays dead. We're in the arena right. leagues. There wasn't that many field goal attempts because of the fact that if you did miss it, it's a live ball. And the guys in that formation are not, really the most athletic to go make a tackle yeah so biggest things i think that that's there's so many there are the, the so many differences the ball is i think such an obvious one because like you said it's leather um and it's also the size difference is crazy um Absolutely. but then you i assume that there were learning experiences in the afl too because we've seen the afl has planned a return but you had the misfortune of your last few years in the AFL. It felt like wherever you went, the team was folding. Right. Um, so what was, you know, what was that like for you kind of seeing that part of the business aspect? Has that helped you along the way? It certainly helped me as the experiences came around because I say the first time it came around was I was playing in the, the PIFO mm -hmm. and Louisiana Swashbucklers. That was an organization that had its heyday years before I had gotten there. And then when I was there, I had to see the tail end of the bad of the business. And it's never the players or the fans that ruin those experiences. It's all management. It's really all management. I tell a lot of the young guys, you know, you live and die. The teams live and die at these organizations by the sponsorships, the what the management does out in the community and such, that, things like that. But having that experience and then moving on and then having other experiences of teams folding, you – at first, it kind of messes with you psychologically, but then you let it go as far as like, you know what, I'm here to do a job to get filmed and hopefully move on. Because a lot of people, if, especially coming out of college, you get down on yourself and you don't play to the, you know, to the level that you know you can't play. And you should always like a job interview, no matter what game, you never know who's watching. And one mm -hmm. thing, you, this team, if that team folds, you know, they're going to start picking out of those teams. They're going to start bringing you in. And so that kind of helped me out as far as not getting it, not letting it affect me, but just working on my craft and making sure that I still build my brand at the same time, did my job to the best of my ability. And then throughout the years, you, you have done a, a, such a great job at being an ambassador for the game and then also building your brand. I think you do it better than just about anyone in the entire league. And that finally paid off in 2020. We got to see you outdoors with Seattle and the XFL, which was such a cool moment for me, getting to follow your career, to see you on that stage. Just what was that like for you, you know, playing in, um, you know, an NFL stadium on national television and for what looked like at the time, the XFL was doing phenomenally. Unfortunately, COVID kind of shut it down and hopefully they get back to where they were, but just that experience for you. It was fun. It was memorable. Um, being in the in hollowed ground, I saw I call it in Seattle, you know, it was uh, euphoric to hear the fans as many that that stadium by itself is designed differently. I could even hear myself <laughs> steps and such things like that. But, you know, that was the, the highlight of my career. But to be able to represent the arena leagues, because over time I took pride in being considered the arena kicker everywhere I've been the combines. And so people had this misconception. So when I was able to make that jump and flourish in that league, you know, it was a, it was a big boost, not only for my brand, but for also the next generation of indoor football slash arena uh, athletes, not just kickers, but athletes to make that jump because there's a lot of great players. There's a lot of great players in those leagues and they just get overlooked at over time, yeah. but it was, fun. Uh, the XFL was doing great. Um, I mean, every experience just with the fans and meeting some like legends of the game, you know, my, my head coach was Jim Zorn. I mean, all, a guy who I had seen on just like NFL films Yeah. Uh, and to meet Steve Largent uh, in person, shake his hand. I'm like, Oh man, you, you just don't get those experiences to even see him in the, the first game warming up. And I'm like uh, servicing the punter 
of Brock Miller. And he's like, look behind. And I look back and I'm like, oh, look, that's uh, Shane O'Matic back there and then Triple H. And then in you know, our games, we got Stephen McMahon. So it's like cool to see those heroes I've watched, you know. Absolutely. So it's something that I will cherish for the rest of my life, even on my dying day. But, you know, I've always uh, made my career in the arena leagues. And it was unfortunate not to be able to go back to the XFL. It looks like they're going with the younger route. And just, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And hopefully they take into consideration a lot of these arena players. Yeah, and the IFL-XFL partnership, hopefully that allows that to happen. Um, now, I want to ask a couple questions and um, kind of pick your brain a little bit. You, the thing that stood out to me that always made me remember you, you have probably the most accessories of any kicker who will ever play the game. Is that, has that always been how you performed? Or was there just one day you said, look, I can wear a visor. I'll rock this. What was the motivation behind that? That started since 2003, my freshman year in high school. So, <laughs> Did you, you must have, the, the coaches must have made fun of you. To, first year of high school, you come out wearing all that stuff. Well, it, it was before I wore a visor. I remember, I don't know, man. I have never talked about this, but my in 2003, I, we were getting equipment for our freshman team. And, you know, our high school equipment room looked like it hadn't been renewed since the 1970s. Well, I found a two bar plastic face mask, the typical two bar you see like in the 70 films. And I thought that was cool. And I wore it for one game. And I'll never forget how much. Uh, how much uh, people were making fun of me. Even the referees were like, oh, wow, that's something I wore back in my day. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> then I wanted to buy the typical face mask for a kicker at that time. And, you know, I, you know, this is pre eBay and all that stuff. So I had to look at the little catalogs and cut a couple of lawns to afford this face mask, which I still use. Um, and depending on the helmet that we have, I've had it since 2003 and I put a visor on it. Now, how that started, I thought it was cool. It was a clear visor, but then it served a great purpose, especially my rookie year in the IFL. When I took it off, because I wore it all throughout college and high school, I took it off for one game. And I thought, and Dixie Wynn was our quarterback, it was playing against the Wichita Wild at the time, and I went in for a tackle instead of the guy face, uh, like like stiff-arming me, mm -hmm. he this, and then messed up my eye, my left eye. So I put that back on, and then, you know, my eye kind of messed up a little bit at the time and then the lighting was kind of weird. So I went to a darker visor yep. because it seems like um, the Omaha beef back in the day, if you were the opposing kicker, they had a projector behind the goalpost and they would lift it up and it'd be a strobe light. Oh, just wow. Fine. And so it would mess up with your eyesight, but with a darker visor, never had an effect. And as time went on, I wanted to emulate some of my heroes. Jay Feely wore gloves. I never wore gloves, but he was really, really in good shape. And one of the great arena kickers, Nick Pertwee, who mm -hmm. played for the Sabre Cats and many old teams, um, he had this, this build and look that, about him that I wanted to emulate him. Yeah. And so there goes the straps. There goes uh, anything else as far as reshaping my body. But I never looked at it as like one of those like the, the common swag look. I thought it was just like, you know, this is who I am. I always like to go tackle. At least I'm protecting myself over. Um, yeah. You know, of the, of the season but it's it's that's how it started so it's always been i it's always been one of my favorites man so and it's a it's a fantastic story and then um lastly before we uh kind of wrap this up you're talking about chris dixon he's yeah i think everyone agrees that he is the greatest indoor football league quarterback of all time i think daquan neal and drew powell two guys who we've seen over the last couple of years are kind of this new era Fortunately, Absolutely. Daquan has made his way outdoors. You've seen him up close. What is <laughs> what is the thing that makes him so special, just from a player's point of view? It's the commanding presence that these quarterbacks have, like a Drew Powell and Daquan Neal, and then seeing some of the great, like Nick Davila, Chris Dixon back in the day. It's, it's the commanding presence that they have in their character and their work ethic. And these guys that want to make that jump, I think they have a, benef a much bigger benefit making that jump because they have to play the game faster, but mm -hmm. so they have to have different, um, their progressions are faster. And it's just a matter of their work and how they are disciplined to be able to work day in and day out. And also in the off season, um, it's, it's amazing to have seen what these new 
hybrid quarterbacks can do with their legs. Yeah. It's, I'd hate to be the linebackers trying to read these guys and trying to chase them down. Um, and then let alone some of these quarterbacks, uh, I think Drew Powell's more built more like, uh, down the field than Daquan Neal because I've seen Drew Powell, you know, take a hit, you know, or give a hit, you know, here in yeah. these guys. Once he, he gets going, man, there's there's not a lot you can do. There's not, and it's it's amazing what you know the aspect that that gladiator mentality where you know they just have no fear, mm-hmm. and that's it, it speaks volume in that. And I've seen that with Chris Dixon. Uh, I think more uh, Dixie was more of a pocket passer, yeah. at least the, I saw him. So yeah. And then finally, um, Team 9, Year 12, what was it that excited you about the opportunity in Duke City? And then is this still a part of the career that you enjoy, going and traveling and living in new places? I enjoy, I mean, leaving California, a California boy out of high school, and to go to play college in Nebraska and then to move around the country, be able to see this beautiful country for what it is. You know, I only have two more states to go to visit. Wow. What are yeah. they? Uh, West Virginia and Hawaii. <laughs> okay. All right. States, I'm like, they're, they're pretty accessible, but all of these states I visited because of football. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's exciting to go somewhere new. It, it, sometimes players, we see them in the NFL, need new chapters to go to, and they get to restart things again. And you got to build that fire. And I, I admire so much the owner for Duke City. She's always very well involved, Gina. At the same time, I played against Nate Davis back in the day in lower leagues, and he was always been dangerous. Mm-hmm. And you know what makes it really attractive is being able to build a franchise within its community and bring the fan base there, because that's what it's all about. It's uh, as you keep playing this game, it's the relationships you build with the fans, and then being able to help the younger athletes uh, understand what they can expect if they decide to continue with this journey. And uh, hopefully, you know, just being able to be successful wherever you're at, but make a difference and leave an impact. Ernesto Lacayo, kicker for the Duke City Gladiators. Ernesto, how can people follow you on social media? I'm uh, most active on Instagram and Facebook, but mostly Instagram there. And, and you know, I'm pretty accessible at the same time, um, being able to inspire the next generation. He's a great follow if you're into indoor football, arena football, anything like that. Ernesto Lacayo. Thank you so much, man. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate you.